Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Happy New Year to you all. Hope you had a fairly decent uh, Christmas and New Year break. And now we're back, um, back at the sharp end um, with a new year, 2023. Had a fairly positive start to the year for European markets, less so in the US. And I think there's a disconnect that could well continue um, over the course of the past few weeks. Um, before we um, before we get started, um, a couple of risk warnings. But ultimately, I think today's payrolls report will probably confirm to us what the economic data that we've seen from earlier this week out of the US has been telling us. That is namely, the US labor market is quite tight. Job vacancies are still at record highs. And that is going to exert upward pressure on wages going forward. And ultimately, I think what that will do is put upward pressure on yields as well as upward pressure on the dollar. Now, one of the questions that I got asked just prior to starting was, am I buying the recent hawkish tone from Fed speakers? Do you think US inflation has peaked? and that US rate hikes will stop soon. There's a lot to unpack in that, but let's sort of take a little bit of a step back from um, where we are now and where we were 12 months ago. 12 months ago, US markets were trading at record highs. The Fed funds rate was at 0.25%, and um, equity markets were pretty much flying high. Since then, um, the Fed funds rate has gone from 0.25% to 4.5%. Even the ECB headline rate has gone from minus 0.5% to 2%. And the Bank of England has gone from 0.25% to 3.5%. So the big question for this year is, what is the terminal rate for interest rate hikes? When do rate hikes end? And at the moment, you can ask three or four different people and they're probably giving you seven or eight different answers to that question because ultimately we don't know. I do believe in answer to one of your questions, Richard, that US inflation has peaked. We saw, we've, we've seen that and we know that from the CPI numbers back in June when US inflation peaked at 9.1%. We've got US CPI coming out next week um, for December. And that is likely to fall again from its current 7.1% to around about 6.5%. And if it was just about headline inflation, then I would say that, yes, we are pro probably closer to the end of the hiking cycle than we are at the beginning. But unfortunately for us and for US equity markets in particular, I still think that there's potential for at least another potential for at least another 100 basis points of rate hikes from the Fed. Um, between now and the beginning of Q2. Why do I say that? Well, ultimately, this week's jobs data from the ADP um, saw a very, very strong number come in, 235,000 jobs. But it wasn't so much that that really caught my eye. It was average wages on the ADP report came in at 7.3%. Um, weekly jobless claims also fell sharply to 225, from 225 to 204. So jobless claims are low. Wages growth is potentially edging above headline inflation. And that is not something the Fed will want to see. They will be concerned about that. So I think irrespective of what today's payrolls report comes in at, and we're expecting it around about 202,000, which will be down from the 265,000 that we saw in November. The fact of the matter is the focus is now less about headline inflation and more about core inflation and services inflation and wage inflation. And it is here where, while the headline number of inflation is falling back, the more stickier aspects of inflation are starting to gain traction. We're seeing it to a lesser extent here in the UK as well, where wage inflation is trending at above 6%. Uh, 
And yet in the US, in hospitality, according to the ADP numbers that we saw yesterday, hospitality inflation is above 10%. So I think even if we get a slightly disappointing headline number or payrolls report today, which prompts a little bit of dollar weakness, I think in the short term, the dollar is on course for a little bit of a modest rebound. We've certainly seen that in the last 24 hours in the way the market has responded to that ADP report yesterday, but also more importantly, um, that those jobless claims numbers and those wages numbers. If we look at the way Euro dollar has behaved over the course of the past um, few days or past couple of days, it's broken below this series of lows through here at around about 105.70 and now appears to be heading back towards the 50-day moving average and this series of lows through here at around about 104.40. So yes, I do think the dollar has peaked, but I think given where we are now, given the fact that the Fed is likely to raise rates again in February, 1st of February, by 50 basis points, the reality is, given where we are when it comes to the actual US labour market, I think the Fed will feel emboldened by the fact that they can hike by another 50 basis points in February and potentially leave the door open for another two lots of 25 heading towards the end of Q1. That would put the terminal rate at 5.5%. Now, the markets don't have the terminal rate at 5.5% at the moment. And if you actually look at the US two-year yield, that is, that is at around about 4.5%. So the market that is not pricing in much in the way of extra rate hikes this year over and above 50 to 75 basis points is certainly not pricing in a terminal rate above 5.25%. Certainly Neil Kashkari of the Minneapolis Fed, who in the past has been very dovish when it comes to um, US interest rate policy, is talking about a terminal rate of above 5.4%. Well, that's 90 basis points above where the Fed funds rate is at the moment. Similarly, I think in Europe and the UK, the terminal rate is probably quite a bit higher from where we are at the moment. The bigger question is, who's got the most capacity to hike rates the most between now and the end of Q1? And ultimately, the market thinks it's the Federal Reserve, and that is exerting upward pressure on yields it exerting upward pressure on the US dollar. And that is particularly notable if we look at dollar yen. Dollar yen, we've seen a big rally this week alone after hitting lows of 129.50 um, earlier this week. We've seen really strong gains. The big level on dollar yen is 134.80. What's particularly notable about this, and those of you who like candlestick charts, will like this. That looks like a bullish weekly reversal. So if that if that weekly reversal is confirmed um, by the end of this week, which looks likely which it looks increasingly likely that it will, we've got the potential to see a little bit of a dollar rebound over the course of the next few days and weeks, which could push dollar yen back towards 140 in the short to medium term. That in turn will exert downward pressure on the likes of euro dollar as well as the nasdaq and the s p 500 if we look at the s p 500 this is the level that i've got my eye on 3780 if we get a strong payrolls report in around about seven minutes time then we could well see a retest of these lows 3780 if i change that to a four hour chart we can see that here you can see the area of support all the way through here we could see the S&P start to ratchet lower and retest the lows that we saw back in October of around about around just below the 3,600 level. As I say, it needs a decent payrolls report for that to unfold. But ultimately, I think from what we're seeing at the moment, if you look at the S&P 500 and if you look at the NASDAQ in particular, the NASDAQ is looking especially vulnerable. If we look at um, the, the trend line from the peaks, that we saw just over a year ago. It's held quite nicely all the way down. Really solid support in and around this area here, 10,400, 10,500. It also happens to be a 50% retracement of the entire up move 
from the 2020 lows to the record highs back in November 2021. We've rebounded off that 50% level, and that's going to be a key level. It's going to be a key test going forward if yields continue to push higher. And ultimately, I think when you're looking at companies like Tesla, when you're looking at companies like Amazon um, and Meta, uh, who've lost an awful lot of value um, over the course of the past 12 months, I think these growth stocks are likely to come under increasing pressure if yields start to edge higher and the prospect of further Fed rate hikes over and above what the market is pricing in starts to get priced into a rebound in the dollar and the upward pressure that we're seeing on US Treasury yields, which have seen a fairly decent rebound so far this week. At the moment, the US two-year yield is around about 4.5%. We can see that here. It's up 3.8 basis points so far today. Have a, I'm going to pay, be paying particular attention to the wages numbers. I think they're probably more important than anything else, but also in terms of services jobs um, in the US economy and how resilient that sector is there. And there's an awful lot of debate about how resilient, how tight the US labor market is. Well, when you've got 10 and a half million vacancies um, and you've got ADP wage growth trending between seven and 10%, I would suggest the market is pretty tight. Therefore, even though some Fed members are arguing that they are getting closer to the level at where they might want to um, look at a pause, I think I think they're, they're only really going to start talking about a pause once the Fed funds rate is above 5%. And that means that that's likely to come after the February meeting. In the here and now, markets are still pricing in the prospect of a rate cut this year. I think that's too early at this point in time. And I also think it's optimistic when you've got core inflation above 6%. Yes, it could fall back next week when the US CPI numbers come out on the 12th. We're expecting it to fall back to 5.7%, but it's still nearly three times above um, the, the Fed's 2% inflation target. Let's not forget all of these central banks have inflation targets of 2%, and they are well north of them. Inflation is well north of them at the moment. So I think any prospect of a dialing back of rate hikes, even though we're close to it, I think it's too early to start pricing that in at this point in time. So we're three basis points higher at the moment on the US two year. If we go back to what the expectations are for non-farm payrolls, the important numbers as far as I'm concerned, it's not so much the headline number, 202,000. The last seven months have seen the actual number come out above the headline number. I don't anticipate that will change that much. Generally, there tends to be an awful lot of additional hiring in the lead up to Thanksgiving and Christmas, and that could be reflected in the numbers there. Also keep an eye out for revisions to the November numbers. I think they're also um, particularly useful, but I think the real, the real headline number is the average hourly earnings numbers. Um, the expectation there is month on month for uh, that's to rise 0.4%, which was slightly down from the 0.6% we saw in November. On an annualized basis, we're expecting those numbers to come back, or the forecasts are for 5.1% down to 5%. I'm skeptical that average hourly earnings are going to slip back if the ADP numbers are any guide. I, th I think the risk is probably more to the upside, but even if it is and, and average hourly earnings come in slightly softer than expected, that will probably only prompt temporary dollar weakness um, in, in the wider scheme of things. I think at the moment, um, the dollar does look fairly strong in the short to medium term. Yes, I think it's peaked, but I think it's due a little bit more strength over the course of the next few days and weeks. So we are just coming up to um, the headline numbers. Let's have a quick look at cable before um, we get to the actual numbers again. That's looking really sick at the moment. We've broken below the 50-day moving average. And again, a, a decent payrolls report is probably going to see cable retest 
this area down here around about 117.60. Um, so another 100 basis points down from where we are at the moment. Any rebound is likely to find fairly decent resistance in and around that 120 area, which acted as support all the way through here in these daily candles and the back end of 2022. Now that we're below it, um, the risk is that we could well see further losses going forward towards 116 and 115 in the short to medium term. As I say, a little bit of dollar strength in the interim that's likely to put a little bit of downward pressure on US equity markets. And the numbers are now out. That's the Canada numbers that you can see up there at the moment. Um, Non-farm payrolls comes in at 223. So that's 20,000 above expectations. Average earnings 4.6%. So that's slightly weaker than expected. So that's probably going to that's going to push the dollar down. And we're certainly seeing that. The unemployment rate has fallen to 3.5%. Um, the revision to November average hourly earnings is 4.8%. So wages slightly softer, headline number slightly stronger, unemployment lower, um, Canada payrolls better than expected. So again, a fairly mixed report, probably going to see a little bit of a rebound in cable and in euro dollar. Certainly seeing that in the overall numbers, cable back above 119. That's going to see US equity markets rebound in the pre-market off the lows of the day. Certainly seeing that in these numbers here now, as we can see there. And let's have a look at the US two-year yield. Probably going to see that drift lower on the back of those numbers. If we just pull that, if I just pull that into the graph now. And yes, those that, that three basis points of gains, we're now flat on the day for US two-year yields. So all in all, a fairly disappointing number on the headline number. Wages weaker than expected, unemployment lower. It's not really going to change the overall narrative of a resilient US labor market. The wages numbers are disappointing. Um, I don't think it's going to mean anything above, I don't, I don't think it's going to change the fact the Fed is likely to do 50 basis points in February. Um, the bigger question is really what comes after that. So just to recap, um, a mixed payrolls number based on the numbers that we've seen come out thus far. I'm still passing the numbers at the moment as we speak. So I'm going to have to bear with me a second just to, just to pull that out of the way. So US December unemployment rate falls to three and a half from 3.6 not 3.7. So the there was a revision to the November number. For, it was revised down from 3.7 to 3.6. So US unemployment lower. The US the, the labor participation rate is higher and yet wages are lower. Try and pick the bones out of that one. So that report doesn't really make an awful lot of sense to me on first glance. But I think what it does do um, is it doesn't, or what it doesn't do is it doesn't change the narrative around the Federal Reserve um, hiking interest rates by another 50 basis points um, when they meet next, the end of this month and the beginning of February. So um, being asked about WTI. So let's have a quick look at that had the worst start to the year for crude oil prices um, since 1990. Let's just get rid of this here. And this here, and then I can do a little bit of analysis for you, Leanne. Well, there's no question on my part that there's an awful lot, an awful lot of people are talking the prospects of crude oil up. And certainly, you know, that's a narrative that um, I don't necessarily disagree with, but unfortunately, the price action um, is telling me a completely different story. Having said that, I think there is a little bit of a flaw for crude oil on the basis of the fact that if OPEC plus is so inclined, they can simply cut production. Um, but what we have seen over the course of the past two days is a very significantly bearish impulsive down move, which is likely to see a retest of this $70 a barrel level that we've got all the way down here, which we saw at the beginning of December. This is a continuation cash contract, so it's not going to totally mimic the actual um, underlying contracts itself. 
if you want to see the underlying contracts, they can be displayed here with these various contracts through here or under the related option there. So if we go, for example, like February, we can see the February contract there, if we so wish. Just get rid of that. Close that down. Or if you want to go slightly, slightly sooner than that. But, but ultim ultimately, I think crude oil is likely to find a little bit of a base, probably between $65 and $70 a barrel. But in the short to medium term, it does suggest to me that there is probably um, a little bit more downside left in it um, over the course of the next few days, simply on the basis of the mild weather that we're getting, but also concerns about China. Um, and I know, you know, people talk about China and it's a bit of a cliche, but I think it's very difficult to see a scenario whereby demand is going to pick up in China much before the beginning of Q2. Um, they've relaxed their COVID restrictions. Yeah, great. It just means everyone's going to catch COVID. We've got Chinese New Year coming up, which means that you've got a super spreader event unless Chinese authorities take steps to try and mitigate um, the spread of infections. And ultimately, I don't think that there's the appetite to do that. I think they've suddenly realized that the Omicron is not containable, um, albeit a year after I think everyone else has. And they are going to have to ride this particular wave out. And that means that demand is likely to remain weak um, over the course of the next few months before we see a temporary or a, a tentative pickup in Q2, because I think Chinese consumer spending has been weak for quite some time. It's likely to remain weak, um, certainly I think for the next three to six months, merely on the basis that the Chinese population are probably terrified um, of going out and traveling to any significant effect, having been locked down for two years, they've had the fear of God put into them. So WTI for me um, does look as if it's going to retest these lows. Um, if you get further weakness in equity markets and further concerns about growth going forward, then I think that is likely to further exert downward pressure on prices. Nonetheless, I think the downside is likely to remain fairly limited in the short to medium term. What's interesting is that we've seen a really strong downward push here, and yet we're seeing a really tepid rebound, which suggests to me that Potentially, the market is probably the wrong way around when it comes to um, crude oil prices. So, um, looking, it's the same sort of story when you look at natural gas prices. We've got the natural gas contracts for the UK, um, but also the EU, which uh, you can find just by going to the product menu here, go to going to the library, either select commodities, and that gives you all the commodities that we currently have, and just scroll down. They're listed in alphabetical order. So you can see that there, or you can just merely type in natural ga gas. And there's all your natural gas contracts and what have you there. So being asked about Dollar Canada, fairly solid Canadian payrolls report. Um, looks very much like a range trade on Dollar Canada, Dollar Canada at the moment. Certainly seeing that play out in the way uh, the, the market's been trading over the course of the past month. We can probably throw a blanket over it like so. So that is your, that's not a particularly bright color. So I'll just change the color of that to this. There we go, actually make those lines a little bit thicker. There we go. Well, that's your range in Dollar Canada, um, Richard. I think it's a range trade at the moment, and I don't see any scenario where it is likely to change over the course of the next few weeks. So fairly decent resistance in and around these peaks at around about 136.85, but also fairly decent support in and around 134.70. So I would suggest you pays your money and you takes your choice on this one. That's Dollar Cad in a nutshell on a daily chart there. Um, does anyone have any natural gas broken down anywhere near a floor yet? I don't think so. Um, I think natural gas has certainly got potential to go quite a bit lower. Um, we are, as far as EU natural gas is concerned, back to the levels that we were prior to the Ukraine invasion. 
does that mean that we can't go lower? Um, I think the big test will be in the summer when storage capacity in the EU starts to get refilled. Um, you know, it's like, you know, how do you catch a falling knife? Um, one thing that the EU won't have in the summer is Nord Stream 1. That is unlikely to come back anytime soon, which begs the question, having retopped their supplies last summer by virtue of Nord Stream 1, how will they do it this summer? And that remains the big unknown when it comes to natural gas prices. And ultimately, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a coin toss as far as I'm concerned, but I certainly think that what we're seeing and what we have seen in energy prices, the worst is behind us vis-a-vis -vis with respect to that. You know, and the bigger question now is how much of a rebound will we get? How much extra capacity will come back online? And how much will President Putin be incentivized to weaponize Russian gas supplies in the summer months um, in an attempt to drive prices higher? Um, I think it's going to be a very difficult balancing act for him, given the fact that I would imagine that he will, he will have ready buyers for his natural gas in the form of Russia, not in the form of Russia, in the form of China and India, and ultimately um, the EU, the US, and the UK will source their they will source their natural gas um, supplies from uh, the Middle East. So we'll be interested to see how prices behave once uh, storage levels in Europe start to diminish. And at the moment, they're at 90%. Because of the warm weather, they've come, they've come back up from 85. They're currently at 90%. How much they come down between now and the beginning of April? Um, copper. All right, let's just get rid of this. Don't need that surplus to requirements. This is a nice little consolidation pattern playing out in copper prices at the moment. And ultimately, while, while I'm slightly bearish on US markets, I'm probably not so much bearish on copper for the simple reason being is that we still need lots of it. We need, we need lots of it for semiconductors. We need lots of it for electric cars. We need lots of it for solar panels so I'm, I'm still very much of the opinion that if we get any dips in the copper prices you really have to be a buyer of it um, because ultimately whatever the global economy does there will still be a ready demand for not only copper but iron ore um, rare earths like cobalt lithium and what have you um, as the global economy transitions towards renewables. So for me, copper is very much by the dips, fairly decent support on the 50 day moving average, but also these lows down here from December. So around about uh, 370 through there and there. Um, and um, if we get a break above the November peaks, then we could well see further gains back towards the highs um, of this time or around about March last year, but I don't think it's any coincidence that while equity markets struggle, copper will struggle. But I think if we look and project further this year, the, the main question that I that I ask myself is, is it likely that 2023 is going to be as bad a year as 2022? And the answer to that question, I think, is no, I don't think it will be. And I think the second half of the year, is probably going to be a much better than the first three to six months of this year. I'm certainly much more bullish, say, for example, on the FTSE 100, for example. I think that there's real potential for the FTSE 100 to make new record highs this year, near 8,000. Um, sticking my neck out a little bit, but if you look at the FTSE 100 and how that has performed um, relative to pretty much everything else, we are right back on the highs of a year ago. And if we go all the way back, the record highs all the way back in 2018, 
7,900 must be, you know, it must be a fairly realistic goal going forward. There is fairly decent resistance currently where we are at the moment. But for me, I think of all the major markets this year, and I'm sticking my neck out a bit, I think the FTSE 100 has the least amount of downside risk when it comes to um, when it comes to the potential performance for this year, um, simply on the basis that you've got banks, banks generally too well in a high interest rate environment, assuming that the global economy avoids worst case scenario recession, then ultimately these better net interest margins should be good for the bottom line for banks. Oil and get natural gas prices, while they've come down quite a bit, are still likely to be fairly decent revenue earners for the likes of the oil majors, windfall taxes notwithstanding. And um, um, mining stocks, obviously FTSE 100 is, got, is full of them. Um, commodity prices, particularly, um, particularly um, base metals and other metals are likely to remain fairly resilient. So um, slightly, you know, apart from Apart from obviously the more consumer facing areas of the UK market, I think there's room for optimism that we could well see a much more resilient performance from the likes of the FTSE 100 um, than um, was the case, say, um, last year, even though it also outperformed the rest of the market last year as well. Any other questions, ladies and gents? Before I wind this up, just a quick reminder of what's coming up next week. And that's also likely to be a key test for US markets. It's the start of US earnings season. So we've got, aside from US CPI for December on the 12th of Jan, we've got the latest minutes from the European Central Bank. Um, remember how hawkish Lagarde was at the last press conference in December. It was like listening to the Bundesbank. Um, so you know, she's potentially talking 350 basis point rate hikes between now and March, which would put the um, which would put uh, the deposit rate above three percent, three and a half percent. Even though she's talking about a terminal rate of three percent, well, that's only 100 basis points above where we are at the moment. Got latest China trade numbers for December. That's also that's on the 13th of January. And then we've got retail earnings out of the UK. We saw some fairly decent numbers from Next earlier this week from Associated, um, sorry, from B&M European Retail um, and Greg's. We've got Sainsbury's, Tesco's, Marks and Spencer's and Whitbread's Q3 numbers. Whitbread own Premier Inn. Um, we've got their Q3 numbers coming out on the 12th. So that's going to be a busy day. And then on Friday, we've got Fourth quarter earnings from JP Morgan Chase, Citigroup, Bank of America. Um, so, again, a busy week, and it'll be interesting to see what type of or what extra provisions these US banks bring to the table, having added to their provisions in the second and third quarters of this year. Will they continue to do so in their final quarter of 2022? Um, so a big week coming up. Um, hopefully um, it'll be a profitable one for everybody. In the meantime, um, I'd like to thank you all once again for uh, you, um, your attendance today. Um, join me next month, same time for the January uh, payrolls report. Um, in the meantime, let me take the opportunity to wish you all um, a happy new year and um, hope to speak to you all again. Uh, a month from now. Thanks very much for listening.